Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work with the serial killer, Robert Hansen. He's also known as the Butcher Baker. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So I'll start here with the background of Robert Hansen, move to the timeline of the crimes, and then look at the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Robert Hansen was born on February 15, 1939, in Esterville, Iowa. Hansen's father was overbearing and aggressive, and his mother was submissive. Hansen worked in a family-owned bakery for long hours, even as a child. In school, Hansen had difficulties. He was thin, he had a stutter, was shy, had severe acne, and was referred to as a loner. He was born left-handed, but he was forced to use his right hand. There's this theory that when this happens, it can lead to stuttering, but the scientific evidence really doesn't support that. Most researchers think it's a bad idea to force a left-handed child to be right-handed, but there's no evidence that it causes any type of speech pathology. Many of the girls he went to school with mocked him and ignored him, which led him to develop a lot of resentment and anger toward them. Hansen felt powerless, inadequate, and alone. He started developing fantasies about harming females. This is extremely common for serial killers. They are rejected by females, and they want to make them pay for that rejection. Hansen spent a good deal of time when he was young hunting, fishing. He was also into archery. Hansen enlisted in the United States Army Reserve in 1957, the same year he graduated from high school. He was there about a year before being discharged. Not long after that, he would work as a drill instructor at a police academy. So we see an interest in police work, which has also been associated with serial killing. When he was there, he started dating a woman who was a few years younger than him. The two would marry in 1960. At this time, Hansen, who was still upset about how he was ostracized in high school, conspired with a boy to burn down a bus garage owned by the Board of Education. The boy was arrested and implicated Hansen, who was arrested for this offense on December 7, 1960. He would be convicted and serve 20 months in prison, even though he was sentenced to 36 months. When he was in prison, his wife filed for divorce. Hansen would be arrested several more times for stealing, although he was not charged. Later, he reported that stealing was arousing to him. He married again in 1963. The couple had two children. They moved to Anchorage, Alaska in 1967. For a while, it seemed as though things were really working out for Hansen. He got along well with his neighbors. He was active in hunting, which is a popular activity in Anchorage. But then we see in 1971, Hansen is arrested again. There were charges for an assault of a sexual nature against a prostitute. When I use the word assault in this video from here on out, I'm talking about that type of assault. Hansen also had charges for an attempted assault against a housewife. He would end up pleading no contest to two felonies and was sentenced to five years. Amazingly, he was put on work release after only six months. Hansen would get in trouble again in the mid-1970s. He stole a chainsaw from a department store. He pleaded guilty to larceny and was sentenced to five years in prison and mandated to receive mental health treatment. He was released after the Alaska Supreme Court overturned his sentence, calling it too harsh. He used money from a 1981 insurance fraud to start a bakery. He said that his residence was burglarized and trophies were stolen. When the fraud was discovered, he said that he mysteriously found all the trophies in his backyard and just forgot to tell the insurance company. Now, around the same time, he bought a Piper Super Cub. This is a single-engine airplane. Hansen did not have a pilot's license for it, though, but this is fairly common in Alaska, especially at that time. Now, moving to the timeline of serial homicide. So, looking at his background, we were up to 1982, but it's believed that Hansen actually started his career as a serial killer sometime in 1971 or 1972. The exact time isn't known. Other theories say it was a little bit later than that. His crimes followed a particular pattern. He would pick up a prostitute in his automobile, take her to his cabin, and assault her. Sometimes he would let her go. If he was convinced that she was not going to tell the police and she did not fight him, that was a possibility. 
Other times, he would use his airplane to take the victim to a secluded area. Once there, he would let the victim loose and hunt her down, often taking his time. There was no rush because there was really nowhere to go and no one around. When he would catch up with her, he committed homicide by shooting her or stabbing her. One of his weapons was a Ruger Mini-14, which is a rifle chambered in 223 caliber. His victims were between 16 and 41 years old. Many, but not all, were prostitutes. It is believed that Hansen killed at least 17 women. Many of the people he is suspected of killing have never been found, and one of the victims who was found was never identified. Based on the dates that victims or suspected victims went missing, it appears as though Hansen killed two or three victims in the 70s and the remaining victims in the 80s. In June of 1983, Hansen picked up a 17-year-old prostitute named Cindy Paulson. He drove her to his residence located outside of Anchorage, Alaska. He assaulted her, tortured her, and chained her by the neck to a post in his basement. He then put her in his car and drove her to a local airport. She was in the back seat of that car with her wrists handcuffed in front of her when Hansen went to load the aircraft. She took this opportunity to crawl over to the driver's side door, open it, and run away. Hansen chased her, but she managed to flag down a passing truck. The truck driver picked her up and took her to an establishment called the Mush Inn. She went inside and asked a clerk to call her boyfriend, who worked at another establishment called the Big Timber Motel. She then took a cab to that motel. This is where the police eventually found her, still wearing the handcuffs. She described the incident to the police, and they questioned Robert Hansen. Hansen said that Paulson had tried to extort him, and when he did not meet her demand, she accused him of these crimes. So he did admit to knowing her, but Hansen also had an alibi from a few of his friends. The police didn't believe Hansen was a good suspect. The detectives looking into the case were Alaska State Troopers. They contacted the FBI to provide them a potential personality profile of the killer. The FBI returned the standard serial killer profile, slightly modified for the specific circumstances of this case. The profile said that the killer had low self-esteem, had been rejected by women, would keep souvenirs, would be an experienced hunter, and may have a stutter. Now, every part of this profile, except for the stutter and experienced hunter part, were fairly obvious based on what we know about serial killers. There's nothing really earth-shattering about that particular profile. The other two items would come from knowing who Robert Hansen was. The police already knew who he was at that time, and they could have explained that to the FBI. So the profile didn't really add any value, but it was used, along with Cindy Paulson's report, to get a search warrant. The police questioned the alibi witnesses as well, They retracted their previous statements. At this point, the police used the search warrant to search Hansen's residence, aircraft, and automobile. They found firearms that matched the type of weapons used in the murders, jewelry that was believed to have belonged to a few of the missing women, and a map with markings on it, like little X marks. Several of the marks matched locations where bodies had been recovered. Hansen eventually confessed when presented with the incriminating evidence. Hansen was charged with a variety of crimes, including kidnapping, theft, and insurance fraud. He would plead guilty in 1984 to the four murders for which police had enough evidence to charge him. As part of his plea bargain, he would have to help the police locate the bodies of other victims. In exchange, he was allowed to serve his sentence in a federal prison. He would eventually lead them to 17 grave sites. There were a few marks on the map for which he would not provide information, So it's really not known what was going on there, but they didn't bring him back to court. They didn't say he violated the plea bargain. They just let that go. Hansen received a sentence of 461 years plus life in prison without the possibility of parole. Robert Hansen would die of natural causes on August 21, 2014 at age 75. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. First, I'll look at the potential personality profile for Robert Hansen. When I conceptualize personality, I use the five-factor model. I remember the big five traits through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So as far as openness to experience, we see a high level. Hansen was intellectually curious, creative, and adventurous. We see mid to low conscientiousness. So pointing toward the high side, 
He worked as a baker, and he hunted. Now, hunting takes a lot of patience. On the low side, we see the murder and stealing. We see mid to high extroversion. On the high side, we see he was friendly and outgoing, as well as sensation-seeking. On the low side, he had few positive emotions. As far as agreeableness, we see a low level. He was not trusting of other people and had no empathy. And then for neuroticism, we see a mid to high level. So on the high side, he was angry, he could not resist temptation, and he was depressed. On the low side, he was not vulnerable. So he was able to stay calm in extremely stressful situations. Now looking at possible mental disorders, Hansen was diagnosed with bipolar disorder with periodic schizophrenic episodes. Back then, bipolar disorder was called manic depression. This diagnosis was given after he stole that chainsaw. Now, interestingly, bipolar disorder with periodic schizophrenic episodes is not actually a real diagnosis. Bipolar disorder is a real diagnosis, and schizophrenia is a real diagnosis, but there is no such thing as the diagnosis he received. It may have been simply bipolar disorder, which sometimes has psychosis with it. Now, during that time, it wasn't unusual for practitioners to move away from official diagnosing procedures like going away from the DSM, just combining different disorders and saying, yeah, this person has this disorder with features of that disorder and that disorder over there. It was almost haphazard. What could have been happening here was the mental health professional saw symptoms of schizophrenia, but also saw symptoms of bipolar disorder and just thought that was kind of an expedient diagnosis to assign. If Hansen did have disorganized thinking and negative symptoms, I can see where somebody might guess schizophrenia because those symptoms tend to be specific to schizophrenia, meaning there aren't many other disorders that would have those particular symptoms. But if he was having delusions and hallucinations, those are less specific. They could be related to many different disorders, including bipolar disorder, as I mentioned. Another possibility for Hansen would be schizoaffective disorder. It's essentially a mixture of bipolar disorder symptoms and schizophrenia symptoms. It would seem like a logical fit based on the description of bipolar disorder with periodic schizophrenic episodes. It's also been reported that Hansen would dissociate. This could be due to something like post-traumatic stress disorder, but we really don't know. There's not any information about that. I find it interesting that he wasn't diagnosed with antisocial or narcissistic personality disorders. It would appear that his behavior could have aligned with all seven of the symptoms from antisocial personality disorder and a number of the symptoms from narcissistic personality disorder. But I'm not aware of any official reports that indicate he had either of those disorders either. Not surprisingly, he did appear to have many characteristics of both factor one and factor two psychopathy. We see this with many serial killers. From factor one psychopathy, we see superficial charm, grandiosity, pathological lying, being manipulative, having a lack of empathy, and not taking responsibility. From factor two, we see impulsivity, irresponsibility, juvenile delinquency, and criminal versatility. Interestingly, he did not have a lack of realistic long-term goals or a parasitic lifestyle. Hansen was surprisingly ambitious and productive in his non-criminal career. I think the factor one psychopathy was extremely important as far as facilitating Hansen's criminal actions. As I mentioned, he really did depend on appearing to be an upstanding member of the community. Even when the police realized he was a felon, they still didn't think he did it, initially at least. They implied that he simply didn't look like a serial killer. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Do serial killers have a certain look, like they have a secret handshake or wear a special jacket? I think what it was specifically was that he was mild-mannered, small, and thin. So from the point of view of the police, he just didn't look capable of being someone who could commit homicide. It's amazing that the police didn't take Cindy Paulson's accusations more seriously, even though she was in a less than reputable career. Hansen specifically selected the victims he did because he knew that their statements would not be believed and no one would notice they were missing. He was largely correct. Another important factor that contributed to Hansen's prolific criminal career was the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline. In the mid-1970s, we see 
the construction starts, a number of people move to certain cities in Alaska. Anchorage was one of those cities. There was kind of a boomtown effect that occurred. There were a lot of people there who were not regular residents of Alaska. They moved in from somewhere else just to work on the pipeline. And people went missing on a regular basis. There was a lot of drinking and, of course, prostitution. So really, it was the perfect area for a serial killer to start their criminal career. Hansen's wife and two children did not know that he was a serial killer. They were surprised when he was arrested. Interestingly, his wife said that she knew he was up to no good, but she said that she thought he was just picking up prostitutes in the middle of the night before he went to work at the bakery. Why would any spouse be concerned about that behavior? This is like if a homeowner was standing outside their home and the house was on fire and a firefighter came up and said, hey, your house is on fire. And they said, no, it's just billowing smoke and glowing orange. Stop being so dramatic. There's nothing going on here. I mean, it's amazing what some people will put up with in a relationship. And that's not even close to the worst I've heard in my career. Now, to be fair to Hanson's wife, many men engage in that behavior and few are serial killers. So that behavior doesn't mean that he was definitely a serial killer, but it is behavior that probably should be explored in some type of therapeutic setting, right? Maybe marriage counseling or something. It's not healthy. Now, his wife also believed that he would become a better Christian someday. So it sounds like she knew that he wasn't behaving appropriately for someone who's married, but she really had hope for the future. Things were going to turn around. He was going to improve. So maybe she was just kind of sticking things out with the hope that that would happen. Another interesting attribute of Hansen was where he was in terms of his development as a serial killer when he was arrested. Many serial killers move from theft to assault, then to murder. James D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, is a good example of this progression. Hansen did murder at least 17 people. There were 24 marks on his map, so really it's reasonable to believe he may have killed 24 people, if not more. But he committed over 30 assaults as well. So it's not clear if he had really progressed totally out of the assault stage and fully into the murder stage. It's like he was perhaps about halfway in between when he was arrested. Most of the time when he abducted a victim, he was open to assault and open to letting her go, as well as open to assault and then murder. If he had not been arrested when he was, he probably would have moved exclusively to assault, then murder. If he kept releasing women, eventually some of them might get together and notify the police. Hansen was a classic domination killer. He was also organized. He had a severe resentment toward women. This developed into an intense hatred. Eventually, he channeled that hatred toward women who did not reject him, who did not do anything to him, which is what often happens with serial killers. They overgeneralize and desire to get revenge against all women, not just the ones that they believed did something wrong to them when they were young. Interestingly, it's been reported that Hansen believed he was falling in love with the women until they offered to have sex with him, and then he thought of them as undesirable and evil. Therefore, he could justify killing them. It's like he was reliving a fantasy from his youth, where women would accept him and want to be with him, and he would love them back, but then that was shattered and he went back to being aggressive. We see with Robert Hansen a frightening combination of extroversion, aggressiveness, hatred, and superficial charm let loose in an area where he could easily find victims and kill with impunity. This case really does seem to connect with that idea of a perfect storm. Those are my thoughts on Robert Hansen. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.